I'm Matt Gishard, and this is No Holds Barred. Today we're going to talk about gun violence, and more specifically, about parental liability and responsibility when a minor child is involved with gun violence. So I'm often asked, what if any responsibility or liability does a parent have when, for example, their child takes a gun to school and injures someone or anywhere else injures someone with that gun or a knife or actually any weapon? And in general, under our laws, a parent is not liable for the acts of their child unless the parent knew about it ahead of time or facilitated it in some fashion. So let's get right down to the law. When we look at jury instructions, and jury instructions are really what the law is that jurors see, and I want to look at Cassie. So this is, these are jury instructions in the civil realm. And 428, parental liability, non-statutory. The reason why I say non-statutory is because there are a couple of statutes that we'll talk about in a little bit in which parents are liable or can be held liable and responsible for the acts of their minor children. 428 essentially says, and it's the rule in the state of California, while it is the rule in California that there is no vicarious liability on a parent for the torts of a child, there are many exceptions to that. But a jury has to go through kind of a checklist of what a parent knew or didn't know at the time of a child. So let's really talk about what we see all the time. A minor child takes a weapon from the home and goes to school and kills a number of people, including a teacher. Sadly, we've heard that so often. What is the liability of the parent? In almost every one of those cases, we see that people knew, the parents knew, there were problems with the child, there was something just haywire. But in most of those cases, there isn't an issue that the parents knew that the child had a gun, took a gun, did whatever. It's very important that that threshold be reached. So just because the child has some mental issues, doesn't mean the parent is responsible. And there is an interesting case in California, and it's Smith versus Frund, F-R-U-E-N-D. And that is a 2011 case, and that is a case in which actually an adult child was over the age of 18, but murdered another person. The parents were aware, the child actually had Asperger's, and the parents were aware of a number of issues with their son, but nothing that rose to the level of taking a gun or a knife or anything to school. And that case went up. Uh, it, it was uh, defeated on summary judgment. In other words, the plaintiffs brought the case against the parents for their dead child, and uh, the court granted the motion to dismiss uh, on summary judgment. It went up to the Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal ruled that uh, the case had to go back to the trial court for some additional evidence. It did go back to the trial court, but ultimately the, it was found to be the parents were not responsible. But let's talk about the case in which a parent teaches a child how to use a gun, provides the gun to the child, and the child then takes that gun to school and injures somebody. Is there negligence there? Um, well, in some cases, there can be. Now, if the family's a hunting family, they're a rural family, the child uses a gun regularly, there's no issue of threatening anyone or doing anything such as that, it could very well be that the parents, again, are not responsible. But as we know, under the state of California, there is a rule that parents, or anyone, is to keep a gun locked up that is secured. So what if the neighbor kid comes into the parent's house and happens to find that gun in a, in a side drawer or under a mattress 
and takes that gun and injures somebody. That parent is liable. Why? Because the gun was not secured. It was easily accessible either to their minor child or to a, uh, a neighbor or a, a classmate or a friend of the child. So we look at things and we say, you can't leave the gun lying around. You have to have your weapon secured, preferably in a gun safe, but certainly with a trigger lock, you want to make sure that the shells are separated from it and also locked up so that under no circumstance, even accidentally, a parent uh, weapon cannot be used. How often do we hear about some young child finding a gun in, a, in the nightstand and playing with it and kills himself or kills uh, a brother or a sister or a friend? In that case, under the laws of the state of California, that parent is absolutely responsible because that gun should never have gotten into the hands of that minor child. So we want to talk about penal section uh, 25100, and we call it criminal storage of a firearm. So that can be a felony or a misdemeanor. And in those cases, it goes to whether or not that weapon was secured. So I'm not going to get into too much of whether the child somehow uh, found the key and somehow got the weapon that was otherwise secured or had a gun lock on it and he had somebody uh, saw it off. It could very well be the parents are not responsible. But we do want to look very carefully and think about every situation, secure that weapon and ensure that you don't let it get into the hands of anyone. Now we do remember the case in which a mother trained her son who had all kinds of mental issues in another state, trains her son on how to use the gun. Um, they often went to the gun range and that child had access to that gun and went to school and killed a number of people. You've probably all remember that case. That mother is absolutely responsible under our laws for those, uh, for those killings. So let's talk a little bit, I said about uh, non-statutory. That means just general negligence. So a parent has to be negligent. But we have a code section, uh, the education code section of 48904A1, and it talks about willful misconduct of a child. We also have um, civil code section 1714.1, and it makes parents and guardians, listen to this, vicariously liable for up to $25,000 for their child's willful misconduct. And to be liable under this section, however, the child's conduct must result in injury or death to another person or injury to another person's property. So when you think about that, gosh, 25,000 isn't very much, but that is the maximum amount. So there was a case in which a very young child sitting in the parent's car and released the emergency brake and the car rolled back and seriously injured some people. And they looked at this civil code, at this code section 1714.1 and found that it didn't rise to the level of willful misconduct. That child just accidentally did that, didn't rise to the level of willful misconduct, and therefore the parents were not responsible for, under that statute, for up to 25000 in damages for the injured person. Now, it could very well be that uh, on that other negligent standard that I was talking about that a parent could be liable under that circumstance for let's say negligently leaving the child in the car and uh, enabled to play with the car and cause it to roll down the hill. So liability imposed on a person, there is liability under the California Vehicle Code uh, 17707 and 17708. And that is liability imposed on a parent who signed for their minor child. So we're talking about guns as opposed to vehicles, but I just wanted to mention that under the vehicle code, the parent's liability is vicarious and it can be rise to the highest level uh, if the child injures somebody in an automobile and it's a minor child. Then the liability is imposed on the person who signed and verified the application for a driver's license, and that's civil liability. 
and it's joint and several, so the parent is liable for any and all uh, that the child uh, um, was involved with. So, child gets in a very serious accident, seriously injures somebody, there is no 25,000 limit in that case. The case of willful misconduct, so there has to be willful misconduct. So let's say that young child, three or four, released the brake. Let's say there was a child, 12 or 13, who purposefully released the brake. And it was held that, did that on purpose to make the car roll back, it was found to be willful misconduct. The parents certainly then could be liable under that 1714.1. In criminal cases, as I said, that 25100, failure to secure the weapon, that's a very, very big thing. So Education Code Section 48904A1 uh, can make a parent liable, responsible um, for all damages uh, that their child um, is involved with at a school or with a school employee, and that rises so that, that, that goes all the way from the level of uh, defacing property, uh, uh, injuring someone, injuring someone on school grounds. And that is a specific education code section. But again, it has to be that the child willfully, willfully uh, conducted that conduct. And in case you think of going in and lighting the school on fire or injuring somebody or injuring the personal property of somebody on school grounds. so. We finally have Penal Code Section 272, which is contributing to the delinquency of a minor. So that Penal Code Section can come in in cases in which uh, the parent has allowed the child, say, to drink and injure somebody or drink and take their gun to school or do anything. So there are a number of tools. But the, the, the bottom line question is, in general, unless there's some willful misconduct, in general, uh, unless there's some negligence, even rising to the level of gross negligence on the part of the parent, a parent is not liable for the sins of the child in gun violence cases. This concludes this episode of No Holds Barred on parental liability and responsibility with respect to gun violence. Be sure to like and subscribe. See you next time on No Holds Barred.